Okay, so uh, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to talk about this topic, customer journeys. I don't think it gets enough attention in our world of content and content strategy and content design in the content universe um, and it needs to get more attention. So tonight we're gonna talk about content and customer journeys. I really believe that it's a fundamental tool that we need to be leveraging more frequently and more often. And we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna, first of all, talk about why um, we need to be leveraging it. Um, and I'm gonna start this a little bit as an inversion. I'm gonna talk about key ingredients for poor customer content experiences. Then I'm gonna talk about key ingredients for good customer content experiences. Then we're gonna showcase customer journeys. And that's really what I think can be a connective tissue for getting the best out of uh, good customer content experiences and being able to distill those and make meaning of those in 2021, which is where we are today. Um, then we're gonna go through, and if this is remedial for some of you who know how to do this, apologies, but Paula asked me to give more of a how-to, um, less than an aspirational talk here. So I'm gonna keep it more how-to focused. Um, I would caveat this, on Avenue CX, we have a white paper, it's 30 pages, it's free. If you download it, it goes into lurid detail of how to do what it is that I'm talking about tonight. I will also note, if you download it, please select that you will uh, let us contact you in the future. We are not going to give you spam. We're not going to reach out for sales leads and we're not going to give you annoying, obnoxious emails. The reason I say that is that in a month and a half to two months, we're going to significantly update this white paper with even more relevant and useful information. So it's already 30 pages that's completely how to, but we're going to be updating it based on some learnings and insights that we've gleaned. I'm also going to say if there's anything that I would recommend reading right now, it's James Callback's Mapping Experiences, A Complete Guide to Customer Alignment Through Journeys, Blueprints, and Diagrams. It's a 2021 guide. It's the O'Reilly book. It's highly recommended for, for this topic. Paula introduced me, so I'm not going to belabor that point. Avenue CX, I'm not going to belabor that, but I will say we're an enterprise content strategy firm, and we really try to help businesses create uh, successful content strategies to stand their content up so that it's successful. So let's um, get into uh, some key ingredients for poor customer content experiences. So well, why is this advancing? Sorry. So the first is organizational silos. Um, the number one thing that I feel gets in the way in today's world for successful content for organizations is this and this alone. And this is also the number one thing that gets in the way of good customer experiences. It's organizational silos that internal lens that you have as an organization that you have to expose to your external customers because, well, you just have to. And then this is exposed through disconnected channels, right? So you've got channels. And when I say channels, I mean a website, a mobile experience. It could be a TV, it could be radio, it could be, um, <clears throat> social media, it could be print, it could be the packaging on a package, that in-store experience when somebody walks into a store. Um, it happens through silos because silos create a singular channel focus. And oftentimes businesses are set up to incentivize singular ch channel focuses and singular channel lenses and budgets are granted on how much somebody sells in one channel. Um, and not a holistic picture of the complete customer experience. Um, but these get in the way of obviously, you know, it's a key ingredient for a great recipe for poor customer content experiences. And then we've got mismeasurement, incomplete and, and disconnected analytics. And these can be brought on by several things. One, not having the right analytics. Maybe you don't have the right KPIs. Maybe you didn't start with an objectives-based framework from which to measure, for example, the performance of your content or your customer experience. Maybe the analytics are incomplete due to silos. 
Maybe there's been a lack of investments. Maybe you can't track between one system or the next. Maybe you haven't done something like looked at a cross-channel customer journey to see where your customers are going from one place to the next to understand what kind of metric strategy to put in place to support that. These can be brought on by a lot of different variables. Then we've got the next key ingredient for the perfect uh, uh, poor customer experience, and that's a dysfunctional ecosystem. Content lives within an ecosystem and customers engage with your brand throughout that ecosystem. When it's messy internally, it's certainly going to be worse when it's, when it's experienced externally, right? So that's, that's the next area. And then the next ingredient I think that we have for poor customer experiences um, is this, um, this faith in silver bullets. And this gets promised a lot by these vendors, right? So when people can't fix it, machines can. My dear friend Val Swisher, who wrote this great book called The Personalization Paradox recently, and I have this show with Scott Abel. Well, it's my show, but I'm one of his wranglers. I've got this show on personalization. I interviewed her on this book. Um, it's recorded. You can listen to it. But she has this great quote in her book. I'm going to paraphrase it, but she basically says, you know, technology is not the solution. You can invest in expensive technology, but if you have crap content to, to, to begin with, then you're just basically spending a lot of money and creating an expensive content delivery system for crap content. So um, the notion here is, is that vendors emphasize that their solutions can fix broken customer experiences. If we look at like a customer data platform, which sits across these channels and says, it can deliver personalization across an email uh, platform, a website, a marketing uh, platform. Well, it can do that, but if you don't have good content, if you don't have good integration between those channels and good metrics, you're only gonna be serving up crap content through that personalization delivery. So Faith in Silver Bullets is also part of what's creating these suboptimal customer experiences. Then we get to the ineffective content, right? So as I noted before, if you get other things in place, but you've got really poor content to begin with, it doesn't matter. You can have the best strategy in the universe, but if your content sucks, well, you're only gonna be delivering bad content with a great strategy to deliver it. That gets us to the next piece, strategies. A lot of organizations have failed in, in, in investing in content strategies that didn't give them what they thought they were gonna give them. But this isn't because content strategy is a problem. It's because the way they went about it was the problem. They probably paid a lot of money to uh, invest in content strategies that weren't necessarily performance-based or objectives-based. They didn't consider all the inputs, particularly all the customer insights. If your strategy is not looking at content as an asset, which means you're looking at your business objectives, figuring out how those need to meet the customer needs, and then looking at whether or not it's gonna pay its way, then it's not gonna be effective. In order to understand if it's gonna meet those customer needs, you have to understand the customer. And again, we're gonna get more into what that actually, like how you go about doing that. And this all leads to broken customer experiences. So we have the key recipes, uh, uh, the key ingredients to these recipes, as I noted. Let's talk about sort of some of the keys to um, the, the good customer experience. Whoops, sorry. Um, so what do you need in order to have a good customer experience? Well, you obviously have to have the good customer insights, right? You've got to start with that. But that's going to create customer-centric operational modeling. Um, you need to understand how to model your operations off of those customer insights. And this means that you look at your customer experience, their journeys, and you wrap what you need to operationally around what, need, what is required to fulfill those, those requirements. And that's going to support channel integration. So this is getting away from a it doesn't mean that silos are going to go away. You're always going to have silos, but you figured out how to integrate those and you figured out how to work in spite of the silos. Cross-channel collaboration is the foundation of a strong customer experience. 
It requires the right analytics to measure those experiences across channels, the right content to support each channel. And equally as important, it point, the points at which the customer moves from one channel to the next. Um, and as we're gonna note in a second, in order to understand how to model that, how to build that, you have to understand how your customer is gonna move from one channel to the next, which is where we get into the journey piece. Um, this is also, the other thing that you're gonna need is actual analytics. And the analytics piece of this isn't just the hard analytics. It's not just the quantitative. Quantitative like web analytics tells you what's happening. You also need the soft, the qualitative analytics. This is the user research, the insights, the surveys, the user testing. All of that's incredibly important to understand who your customers are. So as we move into the journey piece of it in a few minutes, I'm gonna keep emphasizing that yes, you need to look at the analytics for these, but you've got to continually go back and look at the qualitative to figure out why things are happening within your customer journeys. And these create functioning ecosystems. All this creates functioning. Notice I don't say perfect. I don't say ecosystems that are um, ideal. I say functioning because what you wanna have are systems that work. It's not gonna be perfect, but they can scale, they can evolve. They reflect the customer experience as best they can, and they're delivering as best they can the content that's gonna support that customer's needs. And then we get to realistic technology expectations. So technology here is, oh, why does it keep advancing? Sorry. Technology here is enabling the solution. We don't start with technology. It is not a technology first approach. It's a technology enablement approach. It starts with a strategy. It looks at the customer requirements. It looks at the business objectives. It looks at the content. And then it figures out what technology solutions are necessary to stand that all up so that it can successfully deliver against the customer needs and hope that customer fulfill its uh, needs with regard vis-a-vis -vis the brand. And that's going to let us deliver relevant content at every customer touch point. It's going to help us anticipate the customer needs and we'll meet them with effective content. And we're going to do this because we're going to understand who that customer is and what they, uh, how they engage at those touch points and what, what we need to do in order to delight them and to move them throughout the relationship with our brand uh, and, and to get them to evolve that relationship. And this is gonna give us a results-driven customer-centric content strategy. Um, the bottom line is, is that we can then use content to quantify the success of our customer experience. And this will help us then show the overall impact not just from an ROI perspective, but from a customer experience uh, perspective. So this is what the key ingredients to a customer, ex customer content experience look like. Um, and notice I didn't say customer journeys yet because this is gonna be sort of the input to, to getting this right. It's one of the key inputs, not the only input, but it's one of the primary inputs. I wanna just, give you a few more insights before we go down the path of, of the journeys. So just to give you a sense of where we are in today's world, 2021. We know that everybody's feeling pain right now. And I pull these slides up no matter what kind of presentation I'm doing right now because they're, they're relevant for the content universe. Um, according to Dynamic Yield, you know, 95% of businesses are reporting personalization as a strategic goal, but only 9% have it as their core tech stack. Everybody's vying for this digital first. Everybody's talking about digital transformation. Um, 2020, only 25% of companies are highly, you know, in higher maturity for digital transformation. This is Deloitte. Now fast forward to 2021, because 2020 was such a, uh, horrific experience for a lot of businesses. What happened in 2020? 
well, obviously COVID-19, but in addition to that, companies had to do things like put their supply chain into the cloud. You know, they couldn't do on-prem. Workers weren't going into the office. This meant that all these issues that they had been postponing to deal with became first and, and forefront the center. And what did that mean? It meant that content problems that they had never really uh, been facing, well, they'd been facing, but they weren't uh, at, the fir- the, at the forefront of them dealing with, now became an imperative to deal with. So now we are at like, uh, let's, let's just keep that in mind for one second. Uh, just this other kind of interesting data points uh, to consider before we, uh, we'll, we'll come back to what I just said. In light of all this, we also know that if you can differentiate, and differentiation means differentiating with exceptional customer experience, if you can differentiate and get that right, you can win. You can win against your competition. You can win against all of the stuff that people are challenged with. You can delight your customers. You can, you know, outperform your competitors. You can... uh, create a superior customer experience. Even if you're a nonprofit, like this is advantageous, right? Like we know that there's so many benefits to this. Um, So we know it's imperative to get this right. Um, So using that data point and the previous information that I gave you, we're now in 2021. And yet it seems like we have all these incredible challenges. And the other data point that I want you to consider is that right now, the focus is shifting from companies are doing spend not on marketing, they're doing spend on customer experience initiatives. So a lot of companies have moved their budgets out of marketing spend to customer experience. And what they were spending on marketing, they've moved in the marketing budgets to loyalty and retention marketing, which has more of a customer experience focus than it does acquiring new customers or content marketing. All of this is pointing to the fact that customer experience, understanding who your customers are, meeting their needs and delivering content that's going to be able to stand those customers up so that they're successful, all this points that that is going to become highly critical this year and in the near future. As, as we move forward. This, this uh, first point here, 80% of marketers have invested will abandon their efforts. Gartner came out with this statistic right before COVID hit and it kind of got buried, but they said the reason for this was, was that businesses weren't seeing a return on investment because they couldn't set it up successfully. If you dove a little bit more into their analysis, the reason they weren't able to see success on it was a lot of them didn't set it up uh, correctly. They didn't take things like the right customer insights. They didn't do things like the journey maps or set the strategy in place or have the right content to support it. So the reason I leave this in here is we're going to talk about uh, customer journeys as an input to getting all these things right and to be able to set up businesses so they can be successful to deliver those superior content experiences. So let's talk about now the customer journey. I've given you the context. I've given you the stage. We've talked about ingredients for core customer experience. We've talked about ingredients for effective content experience. And we've then given you sort of the landscape of where businesses are in terms of digital and looking at customer experience as a whole. Let's talk about customer journeys. So there's many flavors of customer journeys. And Many of you probably, the ones you're probably most familiar with are either customer journey maps or buyer journeys. And customer journey maps are those things that you'll see hanging in people's office cubes. And some of you might have negative perceptions of these. You might think, well, my company made an investment in this and it's just a very expensive emblem that hangs in the corner office cube of, you know, Sarah down in, you know, office, you know, C or whatever. Well, I can tell you they can be very effective tools and we're gonna talk about what you need to do in order to make them effective, but they can also be very expensive uh, 
money sinks if they're not properly leveraged. There's also task-based customer journeys, which is what we're gonna spend time talking about tonight because that's how you can really get traction out of the first bullet here, the customer journey map. So let's look at a customer journey map. Let's, let's look at this one first of all. So a customer journey map, which is the one that you're probably mostly familiar with, this is a visual representation that demonstrates a customer's relationship with a brand by illustrating how she achieves a particular task or a goal in relation to that brand. And it's visual like I said, in nature. The, this, uh, the journey map oftentimes distills a lot of information that is based on qualitative and quantitative insights. But most maps share about six or seven key characteristics. What are those? Well, the first characteristic is all maps are gonna have a user profile, a persona, or an actor. They're also gonna have the scenario, the end-to-end, -end uh, goal or story that's being told of what that user is trying to accomplish. They're going to have phases in that scenario. And here we see stage, awareness, consideration, decision, et cetera. They're going to try to capture what someone's thinking as they go through the actions and how they feel throughout each of those stages. They're also going to look at triggers and account for uh, what's triggering them to act or inspiring them to go from one stage to the next. And then finally, they're gonna identify opportunities in each of these stages. And sometimes those opportunities are content. Now, it's important to note that a journey map is an archetype and it's a representation of that customer's relationship with the brand at a high level. But it's also important to note that the journey is a uh, distilling a lot of information um, into a visual representation. Now, it can prove its worth, but it has to be effectively leveraged in order to do so. So what, do, what, what are some of the things it can do? Well, one thing it can do is by going through this exercise, you can show a customer experience and their entire life cycle with the brand, and it can help tell the customer story and present an outward view of those customer needs, uh, you know, so that you can use that to do away with silos or at least have conversations around where silos need to come together to more effectively meet that customer experience. It helps substantiate customer experience leather levers with content. You can also map content opportunities, but only at a content type level and only at a high level. You're not going to be able to get out of this a lot of content planning. For example, you might say, well, in the awareness phase, we're going to serve them up white papers, but you're not going to be able to get very specific for content planning purposes. You can also expose enterprise level gaps or issues. So if you overlay certain types of scenarios like cross sell or federated search or things like that over one of these journeys, you can create a narrative that shows where the breakpoints are or where issues would be if a customer tried to go through some of those uh, so, you know some of those activities in order to achieve something. And we're going to go into task-based journeys, which are much more micro in a minute, but this is a primary input for task-based journeys. This is also all those other things I was talking about, like modeling your operations off of the customer experience creating a more user-centric uh, you know, content experience. This is a critical input for that because it gives you a lot of data about who your customer is and what their motivations are and what types of content to serve up for them. And it provides you ways to empathize with them and understand them. You can also use this and then look at your competitors to see what content strengths they have uh, versus you. And you can look at the localized content that you have and see, where you need to give that more attention. You know, what have you translated or not translated? Okay, this is a task-based customer journey. So this is more micro. So here we have something that's based on a task where we've said somebody wants to accomplish something like do research for a particular company to see if this woman should partner with this company. Now, let's give you some examples of tasks. It could be download a white paper 
neighbor, sign up for a user profile, purchase a car, convert a lease of a car to purchasing a car. It could be add something to my shopping cart, buy a product. Back in the early days of, of the agency and web development world, some of you may have thought of these as scenarios or user scenarios. Well, in the cross-channel universe, it's no longer singular channel focus. So it makes more sense to call them task-based customer journeys. Um, you're not gonna do these, by the way, for every single task. You're only gonna do them for high priority tasks, but we're gonna get into the power of these in a moment. Um, but what this is, is it's identifying key tasks that the user would want to accomplish. And you would do these for different user types or different personas. And it identifies the different channels that that user would go through in order to accomplish it. So for example, she might start off doing a search, go to the website, then go back to her mobile device, then go to a competitor site, then come back, then you know possibly go to the store, whatever. Whatever those channels are, you're gonna capture that in the task-based user journey. Um, you're gonna, the life cycle stage is the areas in the, con, in the um, journey map. So that's actually the journey map stages. So this is distilled from the journey map. User states, we would use this, I'm sorry, we would use those, whoops, sorry. We would use the user states for personalization. I'm not gonna go into that that much today, but this would be something that would show us where somebody's personalized in the experience. And then there's content that we will then map to each of these areas. We look at what content's necessary to support each of these steps. What this exercise does for these key tasks is it, first of all, provides us a path the user takes across the various channels. Um, so we're able to say, okay, in order for them to achieve this, here are the, the, the primary steps that they would go through in order to achieve the task. Here are the touch points they would touch. Here's what they do when they go from one touch point to the next. Here's what we think the content is that's gonna be required to support that. And this also, if you're gonna do personalization or whatever, can help you identify what, what's gonna be required to stand that up so it's successful. So if you lay this out and you see that you need all this content and you don't currently have it in your current experience, then you're gonna to have to develop that content. You can also overlay this, for example, to localization. If you say that see that you haven't translated a lot of this content, you can then say, well, well, we need to make an investment in translating this. So this is sort of what these maps, uh, I'm sorry, these task-based journeys allow you to do. They're also a way for the rubber to meet the road for the more higher level journey maps. Um, they can help really validate those. So Let's talk a little bit about those. They help establish content opportunities across the channel for high priority tasks. They can reveal gaps in the content experience for localized content. They expose all sorts of opportunities for personalization. And if you do have personalization and you're using any type of click stream or browse path personalization, if you don't go through these, chances are you're gonna miss, even if you're using AI or machine learning personalization, there's still archetypes there's still a uh, typical browse pass that your users go through. If you don't go through this type of planning process, you're gonna miss content that you should be serving up to those end users. Um, you can also figure out the measurements that are necessary. And, and this also helps you figure out which content do we need to evaluate the, the effectiveness of our customer experience. Because you can look at what's pushing the customer to go from one step to the next. Um, in order to achieve these priority tasks. They can provide insights uh, in terms of competitive differentiation. So one thing that I do is I'll take these tasks and then I'll go and I'll go through a competitive audit. I'll go through the same steps on a competitive experience to see what content they have versus which content they don't have. Um, you can then do all sorts of content planning around this. And we can also quantify the value of customer experience efforts. It also helps us wrap our head around 
bringing the right people to the table as we're building these out and having the discussions of what's necessary to support these, it ameliorates the silos and it gets everybody across the different digital disciplines and well, you know, even in store or whatever, the different disciplines together to have the conversations that are necessary to, to stand up our customer content experience so it's more successful. So they're very effective tools. Just really briefly, and we're gonna go into how to build these out in a second, but briefly, I just wanna show you an omni-channel customer journey map. This is just an example of that. Um, it's just mapping uh, the content at a high level to high level journey stages, but there's all different flavors of customer journey maps. And again, I cannot recommend Jim Callback's book, Mapping Experiences Enough. So if you can get your hands on that or check it out of a library, uh, do so. So in order to do these, they're not extremely difficult, but they do take time and you wanna do due diligence. You've gotta make sure that you're looking at the right information to pull them together. Um, First of all, let's talk about design principles. As you're doing them, there's three different levers you always wanna bring yourself back to. And one is make sure you have objectives um, and make sure that you're constantly thinking about how you're gonna move the needle on the customer experience with what they need and tie that back to the business objectives. I don't know if you've read Tori's book on strategic thinking for UX, uh, writing, I'm not getting that title right, but she talks about uh, melding the business and the user objectives together. Her exercise actually you can use to build these out too. Um, but you know, it's really looking at objectives that are gonna tie those things together. So you always, as you're going through this process, wanna make sure you're looking at customer experience and what those customer needs and tying that back to the business objectives. The next design principle is each customer interaction with the journey and the brand is exposed and addressed. So look at what their interaction with the brand is and they, that making sure that you're addressing that. And the best way to address that, by the way, is with effective content. Um, and then also customer-centric content first approach. So put the customer first and then figure out what content's gonna be necessary to deliver upon their needs um, to, to, to demonstrate how content can help fulfill that customer promise. So these are the design principles as you're building these out that you want to adhere to. This always starts with a collaborative team and who do you wanna to bring to the table? Well, when you're building these out, uh, you're gonna start by forming a team to do so. And you're gonna to wanna to get the right people in the room. And this team needs to have different flavors to it. And it's okay that it's a little bit larger, but you're gonna want CX folks, customer experience, UX, user research, user the qualitative analytics piece. Um, that's key. You've gotta have people that understand the customer. The business strategy, um, the content uh, strategy and, and design, um, the regional representation, you know, for global brands, uh, customer facing stakeholders, analytics, product SMEs and sales. Like this is a good list and it could be different. For example, you wanna make sure that all of your, the properties that are within your channel framework, that all of your different channels are addressed, you know? Um, so you bring the various folks that have a vested interest in content and customer experience together. But this gives you kind of a list of the people that you definitely need to represent. You're gonna go through an exercise to prioritize what your key journey tasks are. Now, you don't have to boil the ocean here. It should be based upon what you think the user needs to accomplish. This is gonna be business driven, but you should also look at it from the user perspective. And I mentioned Tori's book, but, but she has a great exercise to distill what's user focused versus what's business focused. Um, there's other ways to go about that, but really what you wanna do here is look at the business objectives and look at the end user objectives and make sure that you're taking both into consideration. So what are my user tasks that would be a priority for the user? What are those? What are the business objectives that the business need to achieve? And bring those two together so that, you know, you can come up with a complete list and then you prioritize. And you wanna make sure that you're, as you're doing this, look at your journey map 
If you don't have one in place, you can use more of a generic journey map, like a buyer's journey, for example. But you want to make sure that you are addressing each uh, stage of that journey map, that you have tasks that can fulfill each stage, so that each major stage of the customer life cycle has coverage. Uh, and then you're listing them from a business perspective and an end user perspective. Obviously, validating it with as much data as you possibly can is key here. Um, and then you'll decide on, are you going to look at personas, customer profiles, target audiences? You'll have to figure out how you want to frame these. A task needs to map to an audience. So whether that's a persona, a profile, a, a target audience, a segment, you'll have to decide what that strategy is. But That'll be the, the last piece of this puzzle. If you can come up with, let's say, 10 priority tasks, that's sufficient you know, to begin with. You're going to break these into steps then. And there's different ways to go about this, but you can look at all sorts of data. You can go to the website and you can look at Browse Path or Clickstream if you have those analytics against. Um, user flows, or you can look at, you can talk to your sales team or your customer support team or anybody with a customer focus and figure out what the primary ways of which customers have completed certain things are. You can interview the customers. I mean, that's a great data point. But what you want to do is come up with the steps that would be required to complete the task and go with the 80-20 rule. Now, we know that, yes, every customer is different. There will be vendors out there that do journey map orchestration that will tell you, well, there's no such thing as an archetypal journey and you have to buy our solution because it's going to use AI and every journey is different. Well, there are archetypes and you can use these to do content planning and you can use these to plot out typical paths the browser that the, the user would take. There's trends that you can establish here and there is a immense value in doing this for all the reasons that I've so far outlined. Um, so you can establish the primary steps and paths a user would take, noting that it may or may not be linear, or they may leave your experience, go somewhere else, and then come back, for example. They may bounce from one channel to the next. You want to identify those channels and touch points, and then as much as you possibly can, you want to test this and validate it. If you can't test it and validate it, then I wouldn't roll out a lot of these. I would maybe roll out one or two and use kind of a a, B approach of testing once they're rolled out or just test them and, and monitor them via analytics and metrics once they're rolled out to see how they're performing and validate which assumptions are true and then course correct ones that aren't. Um, and then fill in if you're doing personalization, the data points for unknown, recognized and known. And for those of you that understand personalization, you will know what, you know, what would be required there. Then you're gonna go through the exercise of the content mapping. And this is, you know, there's a lot, in the white paper I discussed this, I mean, it's more than just this obviously, but um, you wanna think outside the box here. You can't just look at your current content experience. You really gotta uh, go through the experience of putting this through the customer lens and ask what content is gonna be necessary for each of these steps to accomplish what it is that the user needs to accomplish. Um, you might want to look at it from an empathy perspective. You might want to look at it from the perspective of um, task completion. Um, and then obviously you're going to want to test it. You can go through brainstorming exercises, whiteboarding exercises, you know, post-it notes. You can get different groups and breakout sessions where they can each come up with their own content they think are going to be necessary to fulfill it. There's all sorts of participatory design activities you can do to figure out what that content needs to be. But the point here is, is that you map content to those individual steps. And then you, again, as much as you can, test that. Um, then you want to look at how much of this you can support if you have a global brand uh, from a translation perspective. I like to review the output against the key competitors because that also gives you ideas for content creation. It can tell you whether or not you have enough content or if there's content gaps. If anything, if you've done, if you've done due diligence, it can show you that you've got a superior experience, but usually there's a lot to be learned there. Um, and it doesn't even have to be necessarily in category. It can also be out of category experiences that, that you look at. 
I can't say this enough, test, test, test. These customer journeys are all about customer insights. If you can't test it prior to rollout, um, you wanna make sure that you put a plan in place to immediately evaluate it after rollout, that you have a measurement strategy and that you can optimize. And then you're also, even if you do test it, you want analytics in place to measure how that content's performing. And you're leveraging qualitative testing to answer the questions on why things are happening. So remember, metrics are gonna measure, uh, the, the web analytics and the, the hard metrics are gonna measure what? You still need to build in uh, user testing, uh, surveys, um, other types of, of user insights and, and qualitative approaches to, to figure out you know, what's happening in all this. In terms of the measurements, as you're going through this, and remember, content is the key here, because you should be able to look at content, put metrics against it, and determine whether or not this is successful. Content can tell you, is my customer journey successful? It can tell you, did this content push the customer from one step of the journey to the next? Did the content uh, allow the customer, you know, to engage with the brand effectively? Did it allow them to be delighted? Um, <clears throat> were they able to get what they needed to from, from this? So first and foremost, make sure you're putting metrics in place that measure was the task completed. Um, again, put these metrics into your content uh, that you're measuring. Can the user go from one step to the next? Where are the breakpoints and where does the user drop off? Which content pushes the user from one step to the next and which does not? I mean, that's equally as important, right? You're not gonna get it right all the time. I've rolled out these and in particular for personalization and um, we'll find that there's content assumptions that we make where we think that all this content's gonna prove really great. And then some of it performs really well. And then sometimes content we don't think is gonna perform that well ends up performing like as a really high performer. Um, if you're tracking certain behaviors, look at points where the user does not follow the assumed path or diverge. That can always be interesting. And then again, use the qualitative to answer why any of the above is happening. Also look at the time spent on or within each step. You can get interesting data points. So for example, maybe the scroll depth on pages or this sort of thing can tell you all sorts of different things. Um, if you can get in-store data or customer support or call center data, for example. Um, and then where and when do they go from one step of the channel to the next? Now, obviously you can't necessarily track everything, but whatever you can get insofar as you know what you can track, what you wanna do is see how content is performing and helping move the customer to achieve what it is that you're trying to measure. So I covered off quickly on sort of the steps of building these out, you know, key areas to think through. There's obviously much, uh, you know, a lot more that goes into, you know, this, but these give you sort of the key ingredients for success. And I've talked to like um, kind of the why, but let me talk just a little bit more about the benefits because um, we touched on this before, but I want to re re-emphasize this. If you do journeys, and if you've leveraged them effectively, what they can really help you do is anticipate the content that you're gonna need at every customer touch point. Now, the journey doesn't have to be an entirely manual process either. The task-based ones I like to, I, I do automation usually, I get more stuff like from analytics and that kind of stuff, but I do like, I do think the manual pieces of these in terms of um, designing these out are important. I think you can use AI and jerky or journey orchestration to sort of validate them. I think you can go into more individualized journeys once you have um, some of these larger tasks, uh, you know, in place. And then you can see if there's divergence or what the, those technologies are telling you about those. Also, those technologies require decision trees and logic built into them. And this exercise can help you do that. But where I'm going with this is that this exercise helps you identify the relevant content at every touch point. And it helps you anticipate those customer needs. And it helps you then think through what type of model am I gonna need in order to support this? It provides the valuable data points um, 
that you're going to need for your content strategy, but also your editorial planning process and your measurement planning process, because you're looking at it across channels and you're looking at it through that customer lens. It's constantly making you go back to that customer lens and saying, what do we need in order to deliver them the right content? You know, that whole right content, right user, right time. What did they need to get out of our brand what's, what's required for them? And we didn't talk a lot about this, but when you're going through this exercise, putting yourself in their shoes, when you're going through this and you get those people in the room and you get the customer folks in the room, they're gonna make you hear the customer stories. They're gonna make you think about customer empathy. They're gonna make you think about customer pain points. They're gonna, you're gonna hear uh, stories about what really is gonna move the needle from the customer point of view. So it really does give you that perspective in a way that you're not getting by just sitting back and doing this stuff, um, you know, in a silo or without that as, a, as an input. And then, you know, it gives you this cross-channel way to measure performance. Um, not to say that you're necessarily going to have the right technology in place, but it gives you a roadmap and a plan and it establishes what it is that you need to do so and you can start to get some of this in place. Um, and it's going to give you immense rewards insofar as a competitive advantage. You know, people that do this correctly do see a immediate ROI on their investments around it, which is why smart companies do it. And you don't have to even be a large company to do this. You know, you can use these techniques if you're a small organization. Let's say that you want to just uh, figure out how to be more customer centric in your content experience. You could use a smaller team and use task based, user centered design techniques around content planning and content experience that don't necessarily involve the level of sophistication I'm outlining here. You could still move forward with this approach, you know, at a smaller scale and still be successful at it. And then finally, it helps you create a technology solution that's supporting the customer experience. Your tech stack is standing up the customer journey. It's standing up those requirements. It's not the solution that you're putting first and in place, you know, before all of that. So going through these exercises, what they do is it changes the way the organization responds to conversations and dialogue and discussions around technology and content and where all these things need to sit in the organization and how they need to respond, you know, to the customer. And, and it, it definitely reshifts the priorities and I think puts the focus on where the focus needs to be, which is where it gets us, you know, to where every, what people are talking about today. And this is my final slide. It's that, it's that whole transforming disruption into success. So the customer journey to sort of end cap this and going through the experience of using customer journeys for content planning, content strategy, content design, um, this helps really move the needle to transforming disruption and transforming digital uh, disruption into success. We can work together holistically with other teams to really realize much more customer-centric content experiences and deliver on those brand promises that we keep talking about, but keep you know, failing at doing. And I've seen this happen and it is happening and more and more businesses are doing it. It's great customer experiences at each touch point. It's the operational readiness to support it. It's the delivery of better and more effective content. And it, it obviously, it, it creates more meaningful and actionable data. And then obviously that's gonna get you the budgets approved to be able to continue to deliver those experiences. So that's it folks. That's everything I wanted to get through. Wow, <clears throat> that's a lot of information, Kevin. Thank you for all that. Uh, we've got a ton of great questions. I'm going to let Larry sort of cue those up. Um, but uh, and I'm lagging a bit, so apologies. Go ahead, Paula. I don't... Okay, no, nope. just just saying uh, thanks everyone for all the great questions you've been putting in the chat, and uh, let's see how many we can get to before we start to lose folks. 
do I see the questions? I don't know how this works. Very well asked. When it comes to, Kevin, you, <laughs> I just spoke about, no, sorry, I'm kidding. Just ignore <laughs> the chat, Kevin. I've got all the questions queued up for you. You just have to focus on the answers. So, <laughs> um, so the first question is from McGee. Um, they ask, um, when people, um, they, they say, what are the common platforms and solutions you see to be as being as touted as the fix to the problem of people and machines not being able to fix things. And McGee, if you want to unmute and elaborate on the question, please feel free. Oh, hi. Um, thanks, Kevin. That was awesome. I was just interested in one of the earlier comments you made um, about uh, people kind of, you, you know, bringing in technology to solve what is effectively either a customer service or, or a kind of um, content problem. And um I was curious as to what kind of technologies people are touting as the solution. So a few years ago, it was AEM, you know, Adobe Experience Manager. You bring that in and your customer <laughs> experience gets fixed and then, of course, it doesn't. So, yeah, I'm just kind of wondering what your take on the latest platforms are that people are kind of holding up as the solution. Well, there's so many. I mean, it's still AEM. Um, yeah. and customer data, like these uh, customer data platforms that sit across channels and can do cross-channel personalization, but track cross-channel um, uh, analytics. That's one of the big ones. Any of the AI um, solutions that are looking at journey orchestration, they're all, they're all like out there like, we can orchestrate customer journeys on the fly and then serve up content. The problem is this, if you haven't fixed all this stuff in the back end, let's say you, you put in a personalization engine. Let me give you an example of epic failure there. They put mm -hmm. in a personalization engine for a huge semiconductor industry uh, company. The way these work is they scrape content and th well, they, they work in different ways, but let's say they, they scrape the content of all the product detail pages. If somebody views this and they have a rail that recommends you viewed these products. So we're gonna show these products based on this logic. Well, mm -hmm. it, the content's not optimized to support that. So half of the product pages have weird images that look like crap in that rail. They have mm -hmm. long product titles that don't fit in that space. They have content that isn't taglined or optimized for the tag. Mm -hmm. Like, so that's just one example, right? Where that's not going to be um, optimized. Um, it's these solutions don't work if you don't have a robust content experience to support it. So another one would be federated search. If you go in and you scrape all the content from all these systems and you try to then serve it up in a support, um, let's say you take Coveo and you try to serve up all this content for case deflection so somebody can support if they want to try to do self-service and support. Well, if it's pulling all this content from all these different repositories and it's tagged them properly and they call this product something and this this system and this product, something in this system. I mean, you can only imagine what kind of hodgepodge of crap this user is going to be getting in front of them, right? Like, so the problem is you have to have your ducks in order to support these types of experiences and these types of technologies. I'm not poo-pooing the technology. I'm poo-pooing the lack of strategy, the lack of organizational alignment, the lack of good content, the lack of, of proper processes to enable that technology to perform the way that it needs to perform. Thanks, Thanks Kevin. Um, next question is from Lisa. Um, she, she asks, um, for a company that won't be investing in expensive customer journey mapping, how can we bootstrap to use that tool uh, to help inform effective content strategies? And again, Lisa, if you wanna unmute and elaborate on that, please feel free. Okay, maybe not an elaboration, but Kevin. Yeah. Well, I would say this. I mean, there's there's resources. This book, for example, Mapping Experiences is a great resource. You can do it internally. You don't need to hire an agency, but the more customer data and insights that you're getting, I think that you can leverage, the better. Uh, you can build out these tasks. There's the more risk you incur with the less amount of data, with the less amount... But remember, the more money you pay for it doesn't necessarily translate to the better customer journeys. I've seen big companies roll out 
hundreds of thousands of dollars in customer journeys that end up in the corner office of a skyscraper, right? Um, and nothing else. Um, so that's why I'm talking about this today is like, you gotta execute, you gotta be able to execute upon them, right? So you can do it on a bootstrap. Um, I would say, get yourself some good resources, like read a book like this to understand, you wanna build the customer journey map first. And yes, you could use a generic one, but it's not gonna be reflective of your customers. You are gonna have enough insights about who your customers or who your users or audiences are. And you'll, once you start digging, you can figure out creative ways to get those insights, even if you don't necessarily have all the data that you think you have. <clears throat> Consult the resources that are out there. Norman Nielsen has some good kind of remedial sort of entry level videos on you know doing this stuff. Um, Callback's book is good. Um, put together a team, start building out a map. Once you have that in place, you can build out these tasks based journeys. Um, you know, with a smaller team, you don't need a huge team to do it. Um, <clears throat> and then you can do some kind of quick and dirty testing with just a smaller user base. I mean, call up a few key customers or identify a few folks to test them and roll out a couple, you know, and see how they perform. You can do this on a smaller scale. Thanks. Hey, and Lisa also asked if you could briefly define omnichannel. So omnichannel, and this is important because that word gets thrown around a lot. And omnichannel is not for everyone. An omnichannel is a business strategy that seeks to put the customer experience and the customer at the center so that it can be traced. So let me rephrase this. It's like 10.05 Eastern time and I'm a little bit brain dead. So an omnichannel experience is a strategy that businesses have where they're looking to be able to deliver on a customer experience regardless of where that customer is. So there's certain things that they do in order to do this. They might have what they call like an integrated product inventory, regardless of where the customer is. They can purchase a product online and pick it up in store. Um, they could be in store and purchase it online and have it mailed to their house. Um, Am I, am I still, I look like I'm lagging, but you can still hear me, right? You're lagging a little bit, but it sounds okay. okay. Yeah. As long as it does. Um, single view of the customer is another omnichannel concept. It doesn't matter where that ch customer is. We have a single view of their profile. So we know what they've done. So if we're a bank and they've come into a branch versus they've done online mobile banking or they've accesses via the website or a phone, we're able to pick up where they've left off at any given point and what they've tried to do so we can deliver upon their needs. So Omnichannel is a business strategy that seeks to be able to deliver on the customer experience regardless of which channel they're in. Um, and that's really how I would define it. It's a sophisticated business strategy that not everybody is going to be able to execute and not everybody should by the way um but this is oftentimes large-scale retail financial services industry it, it was very big in the uk um but yeah that's that's really what it is the wikipedia article on omni channel the first couple of paragraphs defines it perfectly great we have a we have a we have a just it's all resources and we have like um all the latest reports and everything, omnichannelcontentstrategy.com. If you go there, it's all the latest research on it. You can just download it, it's all free, so. Great, and I don't doubt that Heidi will have that link in the chat in about two seconds. She's been amazing, <laughs> this uh, uh, filling in all these resources. Hey, the next question is from Cassandra, and I think it might follow on a little bit to this last one. Uh, she asks, how does the journey map intersect with the content strategy? I use it as a primary input. Um, so when we're talking about content strategy, right, and we're looking at the content strategy framework, I use the journey map as a primary input to frame the content objectives, to figure out what those need to be from a year to year basis. Um, so 
oftentimes there's specific objectives for the customer journey. We want to roll out these particular objectives to deliver against better cross-channel integration for personalization or whatever. But it's a primary input for making decisions for content objectives in, in the content strategy. Cool. Hey, Naomi had a very specific question. Um, she asked, what tool did you use for the content strategy on the channel map on slide 33? She thought that was- super hired a visual designer <laughs> who did it in Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator. Nice. And we literally, we, Rebecca, my, my colleague, we sat down at her table where she actually did this. She took colored pencils and basically, you remember like televisions back in the day, remember TVs? Um, remember when you used to get that screen when the, the, um, the, it would go off air, but you'd get that thing that would have like the kind of bullseye thing with the different colors. Does anybody recall this? I totally um, remember that. <laughs> when the channel was going off air. That's what that was based off of. Sort of like, <laughs> that's what inspired it. <laughs> nice. Hey, and Lisa had another question about, um, can you talk about how to evangelize the importance of the cross-channel co collaboration for companies who are currently very siloed and this is a new focus in particular? I mean, there's a lot, I mean, some companies are resistant to insights, but if you look at, I mean, there's a ton of, of reporting on it. Like, I mean, some of folks can't stand, like, I'm not, I'm not one of them, um, but, Forrester, McKinsey, like all of the big analysts have put out tons of data on for 2021 on the importance of this. So there's a lot out there about operational readiness to support better customer experiences for 2021. Forrester predicts like they released their big report on it. McKinsey released one, Deloitte released one. Um, I, it depends on, <clears throat> I'd have to know more specifically about the organization and what its drivers are to, mm -hmm. but, but ultimately it's about if you can show how an improvement to the customer, I mean, I always look at data, like what data is gonna back this up? Um, maybe looking at a competitor that's done it and suggest you know their sales are more than ours because they have a better website or they have better content. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Lisa, did you want to elaborate on that? Because it, it, was there anything more specific you wanted to add or, or does that answer satisfy you? Okay, we'll move on. Um, and Heidi had a question. Um, do you do a task-based journey map for each customer persona or segment? I asked the question again, I didn't hear it. Um, do you do a task-based journey map for each person, each customer yeah. persona or segment? I do. Well, for the, for key ones, I mean, you kind of have to, and they're usually quite similar, but not always. So for example, if you get into age demographics um, and also countries, McKinsey does this thing called Periscope, which is a really interesting report. And they survey look at the Periscope McKinsey report. I think I'm getting that right. Um, they survey user behaviors like in Germany, France, UK, and the US. And you'll see like how people respond to different things like privacy, you know, and then they break it down by age demographics. So they have, I think they use the silver surfer as their, their persona profile versus the generation Z or what I forget, but basically like seniors versus, you know. Um, so in the personas, if you especially skew towards different demographics and different industries, like healthcare, for example, and how somebody is gonna access information for um, insurance and what they're looking for that is in, you know, 65 plus versus somebody that's 20. Like when you look at it broken down that way, and this is why too, you got to decide how you want to carve this up. You may want to do segmentation that's based on age and, and demographics. Um, it may make more sense than doing it based on, even if your journey maps are persona based, the task base might make more sense to do, take a different approach. Um, so you have, you have to figure out what that strategy is going to look like. But yes, I do do them based on audiences because they will be different. Cool. Thanks. 
Um, Scott has a question. Um, yes, many growing teams or, or, or content strategists are working on projects that are geared toward optimizing or creating one channel or tactic. What inputs do you usually ask for uh, for a seemingly one-off engagement to gain future traction with the client? And again, Scott, if you want to chime in and elaborate, feel free. So I always look at I always try to look at the larger digital ecosystem, even if it's a singular channel engagement, because that user is not experiencing that channel in that singular channel. So for example, even if I'm doing a website redesign, if they're like, how am I gonna come up with, with user scenario? Like, how do I say, how is that user gonna purchase a product if I can't look at the larger ecosystem? It doesn't mean that I'm necessarily gonna be, have the time or energy to do a whole on map or whatever, but A, the first question I ask the client is, do you have a journey map? B, do you have a, I'll talk to the sales folks. Can you outline for me the buyer's journey and all the touch points? Can you, you know, I look at the larger ecosystem. I don't just look at the singular channel, even if the scope is such that that's what I have to design against. Because it's ultimately, the customer experience is not just that singular touch point. So you have to be able to ask when they're going from another channel into it, what are those what are those data points? I'm also looking, when I look at analytics, I'm looking at where those entry points are. Where are they coming into that site? And I'm trying to figure out from whence have they come, like what other channels have they maybe, you know, come from? Yeah, I, I, it's great. I, don't you love how I lead the witness? Uh, because that was a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of projects that I'm seeing uh, come across are very much like, hey, can you just update the sales decks? And they're conflating content strategy with just copywriting. And I do feel like, yeah, that is definitely one of the one of the key inputs we're going to be having in workshops, which they haven't been having, uh, just to be able to extract a lot of the insight because, yes, we don't know where they're coming in, what the role of that tactic is anywhere in the in the customer journey. So um, that was that was kind of a shocker to me. And I think uh, we keep talking about when you give us one offs like this, we're kind of doing this upside down. So <laughs> that's great. Thanks, Scott. Hey, and um, Jill had a question um, for Kevin. Um, can you share your insights or suggest yes. resources about how to utilize the customer journey to construct personalization? You know, for example, a quiz or, and Jill, if you want to elaborate, feel feel free to unmute a quiz so i say the question again i gotta okay grab my hand right and now. jill if you're on do you want to ask the question um i'm not sure i'm here any anyway, i'll, I'll yeah. so oh, um i guess what i'm trying to get is after we do a customer journey mapping and say you know i want to dive into like personalization efforts so i can really build up my you know loyalty marketing efforts um and I would start with like a quiz to know more about my customers, you know, by individual. How do we make the connections? Do you have any suggestion, like any books or white papers we can look at that people talk about this? So let me try to understand the question. So after, so make the connection between what exactly? Okay, um, like after I do my customer journey. Yep. Um, how do I, is there like a certain protocol I can uh, implement the results to mm, do a very precise, personalized quiz? Um, if I have like new, for example, if I have new members that sign up for my newsletter right. or, you know, do a new purchase on my website and I kind of um, identify that person based on my previous customer journey results to be a specific type, then how, what's my next step? Like, how do I utilize all this insights, you know, from my customer journey results to, to do a better personalization effort? Okay, got it. I mean, that's a, kind of yeah so basically you've done like and it's more around personalization how do you leverage those insights um that you're getting from rolling out let's say you do like 
journey and then you get learnings based on that. So um, based on how the customer's behaving, you're getting analytics <clears throat> and how do you leverage those to fold those back into where you need to take your content or what content you need to develop. Right. Um, I don't know. I'm just looking, I'm listening and I'm looking in my bookshelf to see if anything, um, I don't know of any, specifically to that, no. Um, I mean, what I would suggest doing, obviously, is you got to look at that data. Um, so there, there are different ways to approach that. So depending on your analytics engine, let's say you're using Adobe, right? Like you can look at trends and analysis and you can figure out based on trends, what people are doing, what they're looking at and what their interests are. And you can formulate like, okay, well, based on this, we should make an investment in this or we should start let's say that their search terms are showing an interest in X, like, you know, I mean, you can use certain levers to help guide where you need to not only make an investment in the personalization, but how you need to develop that deeper. Like, mm -hmm. um, I'd have to know more about the scenario specifically. I can't think of anything off the top of my head though, that's been written specifically to that. Ever gauge the company, um, which is a CDP. They put out a book on personalization, on individualization and personalization. I have it somewhere. I don't have the name of it in front of me. Um, they get a little bit into sort of what you're talking about. I don't think the book is expensive. If you look up Evergage and you look up book, um, and I can't, it's the CEO of the company wrote it and it came out a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, there is very, I mean, I just read this. It's a personalization paradox by Val Swisher. She does not address what you're talking about. Yet. Um, if you, you know what, shoot me over an email. Um, I'm happy to, to um, discuss this a little bit further with you. I mean, it's an interesting topic. Yeah, thank you, thank you. You know, I came from a corporate background for 10, more than 10 years, and now I'm doing my own website. So suddenly, you know, I face this dilemma that before I can blame everything on my sales team, like, oh, you guys aren't doing this. That's why you never get the results. But now when I'm doing that, I don't know how to implement. You know, this is like the last mile that I'm stuck. So right. that's why I have this question. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you all follow up on that, I'd love it if you could drop a summary of the conversation in our in the sure. Slack. That would be great. And in, just if you think of it. All right. Um, thank you. Yeah. Hey, another question from Heidi. Um, she, she wonders, Kevin, if you have any thoughts on OKRs versus KPIs. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference? Is that the question? <laughs> or just, um, you just said thoughts. Yeah. So. Um. I mean, one obviously is measuring. Um, I, personally, like OKRs are more, in my opinion, looking at it like for the organization, right? Or sort of for the organizational uh, performance. KPIs in my book are more specific or actionable if you're looking at, like if you're trying to like, look at specific components to a strategy. Like I find KPIs for my purposes, like I work with clients with, they use the OKR model and they generally use it at like the program level. Like we have an OKR that we want to achieve X for our program over the course of this quarter. Um, KPIs for me are very specific oftentimes. And a KPI for me is, easy to implement with regard to a metric. And I wanna put a KPI in place to measure specifically how content performs vis-a-vis uh, -vis a content objective. Like, do I increase cross, does this content um, that I put in place increase cross-sell of this product? You know, um, I prefer KPIs when I'm looking specifically at content performance. I've never used OKRs actually to, to measure the content performance. If that's, I don't know if I'm answering the question. But. Oh, thanks. No, it's good. That's super helpful. Oh. Okay, yeah. oh, thank you. 
I know organizations and some of them prefer OKRs for everything, but for me, KPIs are more specific to the metrics based approach if you're trying to like quantify that. And I think they translate better to like analytics and metrics based um, applications. OKRs are new to me, but I'm seeing them like proliferating, but personally, I find KPI, like I find OKRs to be somewhat wishy-washy and KPIs to be more, like you were saying, specific and actionable. Well, the OKRs that I've worked with are generally more specific to the program. Like, okay, they're measuring something that they're looking to, well, they're more, they're outcome-based, right? Like they're more like, they're trying to say, we want this program to achieve, um, to roll out this website by year end or whatever. And like that's our OKR. Um, whereas a KPI is much more specific. I would agree, yeah. I'm going to jump in uh, partly because we just have a few minutes left, um, but also because I have a question that I think might be kind of a good one to kind of wrap on. Um, so, you know, with some other content strategy tasks, if we talk about sort of, you know, for example, rolling content audits. Um, so, Kevin, if you could talk about kind of how do you keep your, your customer journeys up to date, how often do you revisit them, you know, as, as your content changes, as your, you know, maybe your customers change or, uh, or, you know, you have different sort of prioritized tasks or KPIs. What's your, what's your kind of best practice guidance on sort of best. gardening or, you know, weeding or managing your customer journeys over time? The best practice is to continue to look at them. I mean, when you put a measurement strategy in place, when you look at content, being able to measure the performance of them, you're putting in place an approach that's gonna be evaluating them on an ongoing basis. And so that means that you're gonna be looking at how they're performing and putting in, they become almost living, right? Um, I used to do this thing at conference, you probably saw me do this, Paula, but, where I would talk about the role of personas or user profiles or user inputs, right? And one question I would ask is, how many of you in the audience have personas in your organization? And most of the hands would go up. And then I'd say, well, how many of you have updated them in the last uh, three years? Keep your hands up. Last two years, keep your hands up. Last one year. And like all the hands, but like maybe one would go down. And then I would ask, how many of you update them every year? And like almost all the hands would go down. And then I would say, okay, um, put your, I, I would say, keep your hands down if you all have users or customers whose behaviors never change. Like, um, and so my point there is, is that, especially in today's world, I mean, it, the COVID proves this point, right? Everything is shifting. Everything is constantly changing. So you want to have a strategy in place that I don't say that you have to go back and change them, but have a strategy in place that's, that's evaluating them and measuring their performance so you can figure out if you have to course correct. Yeah, kind of revalidating them, right? The same with your content, by the way. I mean, you're the one who taught me this. If you're not auditing your content on an ongoing basis, or looking at it or measuring its performance. I mean, what's the fricking point? Like, <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. Well, on that note, um, thank you, Kevin. Um, as always, sort of a just enormous amount of great information. We've got a lot of, there've been a lot of good, uh, good things shared in the chat sites and books and everything. Thanks everybody for, for sharing all that great information.